showing us the way we can see, God, and Lord, we just ask that you would open our eyes and our ears this morning, God, and Lord, help us to be attentive to your word, Lord, just give us a revelation, God, and Lord, just send your spirit to, to just fill our lives, God, with, with your light, God, and help us to be a light to somebody else, Lord, just send people our way who, who need your, your love and your light in their life, God, and help us to to provide it, help us to just show them how to get that, God. And, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would set the captives free, feed the hungry, Lord, and heal the sick this morning, Lord, open blinded eyes and deaf ears, God. In his precious name, amen. Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this awesome time in your presence. Lord, we just thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. We thank you for your perfect love that casts out every fear. Lord, we just yield ourselves to you, not just right now, but throughout the day. We yield ourselves to your presence. We yield ourselves to your voice. And Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for giving us ears to hear. Thank you for giving us eyes to see and hearts to understand everything that you're saying and doing. And Lord, I just thank you for the love that you shed abroad for us, through, your, through the sacrifice of your son, the love that's been shed abroad in our hearts, Lord, so that we can love you and love others. Father, we just praise you today. We thank you and we give you honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to finish up this little section on honor that we're doing. We're talking about hearing God's voice. 
you're following along in the book, we're right around chapter 8. It's a really quick read. We've been talking about reading it in class. Maybe we'll do that this week. I think it's really important. The Bible says that the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Right? Right. So we need to learn how... I think it's pertinent that we learn how to hear God's voice. We're going to be led by Him. Amen? So, I would definitely put some uh, put some focus on chapter 8. Check out chapter 8. But we're looking at honor. And honor is one of the number one principles to hear in God's voice. Josh, you got your mic on? I do. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> honor is one of the number one principles that really opens up our spiritual ears. And we've been looking at that. Um, quickly, let's go to 1 John. Chapter 4, I want to touch on something before we go there. 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses, let's start with verse 15. And we're going to go down through verse 19. Actually, let's go down to verse 21. Mm -hmm. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. And God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love, and we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Amen. Amen. So we know honoring, to honor God, you know, we talked about 1 John where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So to honor God means to, to honor his Word. Amen. And it also means to honor his people. So to honor His Word means that His Word has a first place in our life. You know, it's, it's, it's important to us. And when we do that, when we honor His Word, the fruit of that is walking in, we've talked about the principle often, the principle of sowing and reaping. You know, we begin to walk in His Word, we're going to reap the harvest of, of what His Word has for us. You know, that's the benefit. Um, so... This song, the worship song that we just listened to, is talking about the love of the love of the Father, right? And I really feel like that's the call, that's the call of the church today. And I feel like leading into this, you keep hearing people talk about this billion soul harvest and the biggest harvest we've ever seen. And I feel like I personally believe that the end time message is going to be introducing this loving Father to a lost, dying world. You know, and it says right here in First John, it says that the perfect love, God's perfect love, cast out every fear. You know, and so many people have this percep this messed up perception of the Father, like He's just waiting to bust them over the head, or you know, just I like to use, you know, He's sitting up there with this these giant lightning bolts, and He's just waiting for us to make a mistake and release fire from heaven, and that's not the dispensation that we're in. We're under a dispensation of grace. And, and the Bible says that God so loved who? The world. The world. You know? So he's releasing this end time message that, you know, God's not mad at you. He loves you. You know, he's calling you home. He wants you to come home. And we, I mean, we deal with that a lot. We see a lot of, we deal with a lot of broken people. We deal with a lot of people in addiction. Um, we took a young man to the center yesterday. He doesn't even know who his dad, his natural dad is. He's never met him before. 
he went into DHR around nine years old, and he just recently got out at 18. So he spent his whole life, and he's never met his real father. And he's like, I was talking to my mom the other day, and I was just asking her about my father, and she asked me, why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know these things? He's like, because I just want to know who my dad is, you know? And uh, I was explaining to him yesterday just the revelation of the love of the Father. You know, if we can get a revelation of the love of the Father and how much He loves us, and really how much He's become more our Father than our biological Father has. Right? And when I realize in John chapter 17, John chapter 17 is really the Lord's Prayer. The one that we see over in the Gospels uh, in the Sermon on the Mount is dealing with the model prayer, right? This is how you should pray. Well, John 17 is actually the Lord's Prayer, and in the Lord's Prayer, He says, teach them and let them know that the Father loves them just as much as He loves me. So the Father, in John 17, it says that the Father loves us just as much as He loves Jesus. And just meditate on that for a minute. Because a lot of us, a lot of us in here, I never met my biological dad. You know, I was adopted, and I was in a couple foster homes at a young age. And fortunately for me, I was adopted by a Christian family that really loved me, and I was brought up in a good home. But a lot of people have never met their dad. So God is calling us to introduce them to the Father, right? And Jesus is the only way back to the Father. And if I'm preaching this judgmental gospel. And just telling these people they're going to hell, you know, in a handbag. And I'm not telling them that this God that we serve, this Father, loves you so much that He humbled Himself, became a man, came to this earth, and died for you so that you could come back and have a relationship with Him. You know, it's the goodness of God that what? Brings me to The goodness of God. So it says in here in 1 John, it says that perfect love, look at verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out, fear. cast out fear. Perfect love cast out fear. When we understand that we serve this perfect Father who is love, when we, when we serve this perfect love, when we have, we're submitted to the Word, we're submitted to love, it says that love that the Father has for us cast out every single fear. That's good. And that word cast out in the Greek, it literally means to flush out. Why is that important? Because the Bible says that faith works by what? Love. Faith works by love. And if I replace every fear with love, then God's going to be able to move in and through my life. Amen? And get the things done that He's trying to get done on earth. Whatever it is from A to Z. When I, honor, when I honor God, when I honor His Word, then God's able to pour out and use me just exponentially. And I don't even really think we begin to touch the, really the tip of the iceberg of what God's wanting to do. Right? Because Jesus says that we would not only do works, but we'd do what? Greater. Greater works. And it all stems, the foundation is the love of the Father. Right? And He's calling us to introduce this loving Father to a lost, dying world. What better way to do it? Yes, it's good to, to, to uh, you know, to, to share a good word with people. But what's better than, than, than to preach it? It's better to what? To live it. To be that example. You know, people need to see it. And not just in, in outward acts, but also, or just the way that we walk, but also through outward acts of love. So look for those opportunities. They're out there, I promise you. Everywhere that we go, those opportunities are out there to love on folks. You know, and sometimes it is just a kind word, or maybe it's just a listening ear, or maybe, you know, the Lord will say, hey, like the other day when we were at the restaurant, you know, help this lady get her car fixed. There's so many different ways that people are crying out. And the Bible says that faith without works is what? Dead. I can, I can walk by people all day long and say, God bless you and God loves you, but if I don't really extend that hand to them, then how do they really know? You know, how do they really know? So, um, so honoring, honoring God is honoring His Word. In other words, His Word is going to have 
a heavy weight in my life, right? So we're talking about we're talking about praying in the Spirit, and God tells us repeatedly in the Word how this will affect our life, how it will it'll edify us, it it'll build us up in agape love, it'll get us to a place where we can hear His voice, all these different amazing things, and in order to tap into that, we've got to what? We've got to receive it, and we've got to begin to walk in it. And when we do, when we honor that, when we get under that word, then everything that God says, that every benefit that God talks about that we've been reading in this book, we're going to be able to see that fruit in our life by honoring what, simply honoring what God has to say and believing and having faith and trusting Him. You know, the Bible says that He's not a man that He should lie. <clears throat> so if, he, if God says something, we should be like, okay, God said it. I believe it. And I'm going to get under that, right? And, and let's look at uh, James chapter 4 real quick. If anybody wants to chime in, go ahead at any, any time. James 4. Let's sit there for a second because there's another thing I want to look at real quick. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, let's start around verse 6. It's 6 and 7, please. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay. So... Submitting to God means what? Submitting to His Word. Now when I say that, submitting, it just means honoring. Right? The word sub means under. Admit means, it's like a mission. Right? So we have a commission in God's Word to follow His way. And when we get under that, it's like we're honoring that. And it says when we do that, it says that that releases what into our life? That releases grace. That really, and we learned that grace is what? Grace is not just um, a doorway into heaven, but it's also the doorway to heaven inside of us. Right? And I've given that acronym, grace is God's resources and complete equipment. So everything that we need to get the job done is inside of grace. And when we submit ourselves to grace, when we sub, uh, submit ourselves to God and submit ourselves to His Word, guess what? Heaven is released into our life, and then it says that what? Resist the devil and he'll what? <laughs> Submitting to God is resisting the devil. Kind of goes hand in hand. I like to look at it like letting him take the lead. You know? That's good. Let God take the lead. He, he can see further down the road than you, you know? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I was, uh, sometimes... You know, we, you know, like we're praying to God, like God, we, you know, we want to be closer to you. You know, just sincerely, Lord, we want to surrender to you. We want to pick up our cross. So we read the word and we're really trying to transform our mind and the way we think and the way we do things. And then, you know, sometimes we, what is that thing you always say? We miss the. We, we focus on this, but we miss the... We look looking for the spectacular, we miss the supernatural. Yeah, so you, we're, we're looking for this spectacular encounter with God, which is great. You know, we go to revivals or we're in the prayer closet and we encounter the heart of God, but we, and we're looking for the spectacular, but we miss the supernatural. Like this, this thing is a, de you know, like as an everyday, like a song, an everyday yeah. kind of yeah. love. Yeah, You know, and we... Yeah. And we really look at the life of Jesus, like, and sometimes I think, okay, I'm going to focus on just prayer. Like Jesus went away, and he focused on prayer, and and then then he came back out and did ministry. But we 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 miss it because I mean, we're focused on this spectacular encounter with him, but really we encounter him when we when we just everyday action of loving people and loving God and loving people yeah loving yeah. people it's like just 
you know, every time I go to the Center of Hope, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, you know, just going up there, we, maybe sometimes we do little care packages or, and, and really in your mind, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless them. But it's always the opposite. Yeah. Like whenever you're, whenever you're loving people, you're genuinely loving people for, with no strings attached. There's something that, you know, that really just is released from heaven, like this grace that's released from heaven. And, uh, and I just, I mean, I'm just saying, I, I don't want to miss out on the super, a supernatural love of God uh, by, you know, I just don't want to miss the mark in that. And you, you look at that in Corinthians 12. I mean, Paul's talking about these gifts and all these spectacular gifts of healing and, and prophecy and tongues and all these supernatural things that's going on in the church. And, and that's really what he's talking to. He's talking to a new body of believers and the spirit is moving and, and people's lives are being changed. And then all these people are kind of getting puffed up in these gifts. And he says, but wait, all this stuff that I just told you that's happening in the church really means nothing without love. And, you know, and, he just, and then he defines it. Yeah. You know, it's not rude, doesn't demand its own way, doesn't remember sin, it hopes all, forgives all, you know, and he goes out and he and he defines it. And that's uh re- really living the gospel. Yeah, that's good. You know. And every single gift to add to that, every single gift, whether it's a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, is so that we can get people's attention and let them know that God loves them. Yeah. You know, even you know, praying for people, praying for the sick. It's not to bring attention to ourselves, but it's to bring attention to a father that loves them. You know, every single gift, if you go back and you look at it, is like God's little kiss to, to, to people on the earth that need help. Mm-hmm. That need, you know, that need to feel that affirmation or they need to feel that, um, just to know that somebody's thinking about them and someone cares, you know. Especially a loving father. And a lot of these people, like I said, when we opened up, a lot of these people never even knew their father. They never, or if they had a father, they never really knew. Their father never really loved them, you know. Um, but now we introduce them to this loving father, you know, that bankrupted heaven for them, and it just blows their mind, you know. In that perfect love, when they begin to understand that perfect love and realize that perfect love, it says it cast out every fear, you know. Let's look at a little bit more in First John two starting around 3, and we'll go through 6. Because honoring God is honoring people. You know, to honor God is to honor people. 3 to 6, brother? Yes. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word... Truly the love of God is perfected to him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So, good. so in verse 5 it says, Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Yeah, and what's his, what are his two commandments? Love God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. It says as we do this, it says that love is what? Perfected. Perfected in us. Right? Isn't that awesome? Then it says, he who abides in him ought to himself also walk just as he walked. And he went about doing good, healing the sick, and freeing those oppressed of the devil. That's it. So good. Yeah. And that word abide, it means to what? To stay. To dwell. To remain. To respect. To honor. And when we hang out with him, it says we'll what? We'll walk just as he walked. It's just a byproduct. Yeah? It's just a byproduct. When we hang out with Jesus and Jesus is love, then the byproduct is going to be what? Love. It's going to be love. That's awesome. Um, so we've been talking about did everybody find out where we're at in the book we're, we're transitioning into the new section part 2 of walk of spirit walk of power and we're on this little page talking about honor and we're really just kind of doing a review um, 
you know, some of the things that we talked about, and we're, we're brushed enough on it this morning, we talked about uh, honoring God's Word. You know, to honor God means to honor His Word. We just covered that. Um, when we honor God with our with our substance, we look at Proverbs 3 and also Malachi. And when we were talking about substances, we weren't just talking about resources, but we were also talking about our time, and we kind of related it to how we come in here in the mornings and we're giving God our first fruit. And it says when we do that, by honoring that, by honoring God with our time, right, and our resources, it says our vats will what? Overflow. Right? So that's not just talking about financially, but it's also talking about just the power of God working through our lives, some of the things that we were just talking about, you know, uh, operating in the gifts of prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, uh, healings, all these different things that are available through the anointing. When we honor God and we give Him our, our, our time and we abide and we dwell and we remain and we spend time with Him, then we're going to have an overflow in our life. Rivers of living water. Amen. Out of our bellies will flow what? Rivers of living water. Rivers. So that's so good, yeah. Like that, yes. So good. Not just a stream, not a pond, but rivers will flow. That's an abundance. Abundance. And everywhere those rivers flow, there's what? There's life. There's healing. There's fruit in every season. Amen. Yeah. Leaf does not wither. And everything we do will what? Prosper. Amen. And God gets the glory. That's what I love about it. It just shows His goodness. It demonstrates His goodness to a world that maybe has never seen it before. You know, there's, there's, there's radical acts of generosity and it just blows people's minds. Like, wow! Nobody's ever done that for me before. Or nobody's ever said anything like that to me before. You know, and then God gets all the glory. People come in and what I've noticed when people receive radical generosity, it has a domino effect or a ripple effect. It makes them want to go out and do the same thing for others. And that's what it's all about. Um, so some of the things we looked at, we looked at First Chronicles 4 coming down this page on honor, on um, hearing God's voice. What page we, is that? It's right in between. Uh, so I'm on the hearing God's voice page. I should say hearing God's voice at the very top. Yeah, I got that, yeah. yeah. On page two of that, when we start getting, that, okay. we start getting into honor. All right. All right. Actually, page three on that where it says hearing God's voice and we're dealing with honor. Um, we looked at the prayer of Jabez in First Chronicles chapter four, and we saw that honor brings enlargement. You know, one of the things um, that he prayed for was that the Lord would bless him, and the Lord honored him, and he began to increase. We looked at First Samuel two uh, when we were looking at the prophet Samuel. And he submitted under Eli. And one of the things that I remember, and Josh mentioned this, was like, this priest was like... Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, it was, it was obviously not the greatest time in Israel. Uh, that's why Samuel was raised up as a, as a judge of Israel. You know, they didn't, they didn't have a king that they could see at the time. And so, uh, you know, God was their king, but they, they couldn't see him, so they weren't honoring him. And it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest time. That's why God raised up Samuel. Like if you look, if you kind of chronologically look at the spirit. And I, I want to I also point out this too is um, I need to point this out. It's important. Honor has nothing to do with how that other person acts or treats you. That's right. You're honoring the position. That's right. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, if, if we attach our loyalty and our honor and our love to how a human being reacts to us or treats us, we're going to be in the jam. Uh-huh. You know, I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm just telling you. Yeah, I'm so telling you, it's, it's, you know, me, man, some days I don't have the best days. I, you know, I... I or I catch you at the bad time and I say something and it's offensive or whatever. So if, you're, if, if your honor is based on 
man, this person needs to treat me this way. That's not honor. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Well, it talks about, you know, every, every government has been put in place of what? Of God. By God. Now, just because you see a person in a government office doesn't mean that person is godly. Amen. We know that. Yeah. However, we have to re- we have to respect the position, right? We're respecting the position. Now, here's a good word. I heard the minister say this one time, and I wrote it down because I thought it was a pretty a pretty good definition of what we're talking about. Honor is when we recognize who a person is without stumbling over who they're not. Amen. That's good. Say that again. Honor is when we recognize who a person is without stumbling over who they are not. You know, because we have a tendency, somebody might say something or do something, and we want to get immediately what? Offended. And we want to go call some people. We want to go tell them about it. You know, we want to go, we want to go have a meeting with our little wound licking club. Yeah. You're not going to believe what they said, or you're not going to believe. And you know what happens? Forget about it. Yeah. You see that a lot, like when you're when you're helping someone, like they are at their wits end. They're they're you know they they every time they have any freedom or any money, they're they're high as a kite, and they're just and you're trying to love them and you're trying to help them, and they're just like, well, if you would have did this this way, you know what I mean? And they're just so caught up in how you approach them and what you said to them and they're all in their feelings and you really start to see the root. Oh, selfish. Like it's self-explanatory. Selfish. Like the root of this whole problem is is they've never been able to face up to their own consequence or their own actions, the consequence of their own actions. They've always blamed everyone else. They've never honored their father and their mother or maybe never had one. You know, and you start to see, and they, and it's just, uh, it's all about what this other person could or should or did different, yeah. and it's it's completely their fault. You know, yeah. uh, they can't take responsibility for their own actions. Yeah, that's right. Because there's a lack of honor. They've never been taught honor. They don't understand. Yeah, they don't understand what that means. The, the or the benefit. Yeah, you know. Yeah, or integrity either. Yeah. So Samuel, Samuel submitted to Eli, and the Bible showed a pattern where, where in the beginning, Samuel couldn't hear God's voice, but as he submitted and served this, this, this man of God that God had placed him under in that season, it said he began to be able to what? To hear. And the Bible, when you go back and you read about this, this the life of this mighty man of God, it says that not one of his words fell to the ground. Talking about Samuel. That's pretty powerful considering that he was he was under the old covenant. You know, we have a lot of the Bible says that that he who's least in the kingdom is greater than all those Old Testament prophets, and he was one of them. You know what I mean? And the reason why is because none of them were born again. None of them had the Holy Spirit. None of them had a new nature and none of them had the Holy Spirit not only do we have the Holy Spirit inside of us and a new nature but when we get baptized in the Spirit we're also clothed in the Spirit right in the Old Testament the prophets kings and priests were the ones who could be anointed but it was only for a task and it was only for you know a given assignment and then that Spirit would lift up off of them but we've got the Spirit that what that remains he dwells with us now that's one of the things that we looked at the last time we met, we talked about Psalm chapter 2. In Psalm chapter 2, it, it reveals a plot of the enemy, and a plot of the enemy is to come against the anointing because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, it says that the anointing destroys the yoke. Right? So whatever that thing is that's keeping that person in bondage that we've been trying to help them with in our own strength and our own power, we're wondering why we can't do it. It's because a lot of times we try to do it Just like that. We try to do it in our own strength and own power. And God says, no, you need my anointing to deal with this. So in Psalm 2, it says that the enemy uses circumstances and people to come against us 
God's anointed to what? To get us out of unity. To get us in offense. To get us angry. To get us upset with one another. Why? Because if we're not in unity, the Bible says, we look at Psalm 133, when we're in unity, when we're in one place, one mind, one accord, it says the oil flows what? Down yeah. and through the body. So the enemy wants to break the brotherhood. He wants to break the family. He wants to get us offended. He wants to get us mad. Why? So he can stop the flow of the anointing. Yeah. And part of operating in the anointing is being able to hear what God's saying. Because if we can hear what He's saying, the Bible says because Jesus heard what He was saying and did everything that the Father was doing, it says He was given an anointing without measure. That's really the contrast of the Gospel. <clears throat> you know, if you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit, the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Ghost, right? So when someone uh, is acting a certain way and they deserve this, but instead you show them love, that's what breaks. That's the anointing that breaks the yoke. That's it. And that's honor. That's it. Give somebody something they don't even... What they've been doing in the natural don't deserve it, but who they are in God right. as a son and that potential calling that they have on their life yeah. draws that honor in. That's what Jesus did. It says that when we were yet sinners that He died for us. And it, the, the question is why. And it says the joy set before him he because he could see into our future hmm. Amen. we are the joy look around we are the joy that was set yeah. before him yeah yeah and it says the joy of the lord is what our strength what was the joy of the lord honoring others the joy set before him man it's really not all about us mm -hmm. yeah. that's funny because that's the only two times i've done i've studied that because it talks about that our joy may be full, like when we're praying, it talks about our joy. But if Nehemiah 8.10 says the joy of the Lord is our strength, and the only other time it refers to the Lord's joy was the joy that was set before Him, His joy that was set before Him, which was our salvation. Mm, that's so good. Yeah. And so you look all the way back to Nehemiah 8.10 and the prophetic uh, uh, word of the gospel, like the, like the joy of the Lord is our strength, yeah. the gospel. Yeah. And taking it to another level is one of the things we've been talking about in this class and this class is going to help us do and is helping us do is discovering that tailor-made call for each of our lives. So beyond salvation and being born again and going to heaven, God has this perfect calling that He's called us to walk out before the foundation of the world. And that's part of that joy that was set before Him. And He says, I want you to see this. The same way I saw it in you, he says, I want you to see it in others. And I want, I want to use you to help pull that out. And how does that get pulled out? Through honor. Honor will pull those things to the surface and draw them out. Um, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 2. Because the Bible says if you receive a prophet, you what? Receive a prophet's reward. So when I think of a prophet's reward, I think about what some of the things. And when I when we talk about prophets, I I, I believe he's just talking about people that God is God's government, people that play, God has placed in His His government, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, people that He's put in in ministry. When I think about prophets specifically, I think about they they're able to hear God's voice. They're able to see into the spirit. You know, uh, uh, prophets would operate under a lot of the power gifts, you know, you would really see the power of God operating through their lives. Um, those are just a few of the things that I think about. But in 2 Kings chapter 2, 1 through 15, it's dealing with Elisha and Elijah. And let's just take off and read down through that for a minute. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. 
And now the sons of the prophets who are at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. <laughs> then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And so he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And now Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, Ask what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them into two pieces. And he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha, and they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. That's good. Right so I always thought that he knew that he was supposed to be following him, but he didn't tell him to the end that if you're with me. So you, you thought that maybe he told him that before and that's why he was following him, but he was just, he was like, maybe he knew spiritually because he knew he was leaving, right? Right, yeah. There's so much in this. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I often like to talk about in this is, of course, we're talking about honor. You know, he's honoring, he's honoring the man of God and he's serving him and... Um, you know, we talked about going into this that when you receive a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. You know, so one of the things that he does is he, he doesn't leave his side. You know, and a lot of times we, God will show us a big picture. Like God might show you, hey, you're going you're gonna to walk in this crazy anointing, like this double portion anointing. And a lot of times we want to try to just immediately step into that. You know? But this shows a process. You know, this shows a process. And, and I've, I've used this example before, and it's worth repeating, that a lot of times we want to get to the oak tree and we want to, what, bypass the acorn. Right? A lot of us are trying to, to, to get to the oak tree and we're stepping over the acorn. And we need to just, the Bible talks about what blossom where we're planted. And just spending time, when you see this process, these different places that they went to, what was God doing with Elisha in this process? I believe he was preparing him. You know? In that process of waiting, of getting to the big picture, right? Of getting into that, that, that season where God is just really going to release that river out of our life, there's a process that leads up to that. And it comes through what? A body. Yeah. You notice... Uh, An honor. Yes. Elisha was pressing in here. He wasn't allowing anything to deter him. That's good. Y'all hear that? Elisha was pressing in. He didn't allow anything. You know, we're talking... We've been talking about offenses. We've been talking about the small foxes. We've been talking about distractions. We've been talking about... Yesterday, John was talking about the traps. You know not letting anything deter us from what God is calling us into. 
that he decided he's like, I'm going to arrive with this dude. You know, like no matter what, no matter where he goes or how far he travels, I, I see the call of God on his life. I see what he's doing. I like it. And I'm going to partner myself with him. And no matter what, I'm riding. Yeah, so I looked up a few of these words. I was just curious. So in chapter 1 where it talks about it talks about this place, Gilgal. We were talking about this when we opened up. The word Gilgal means a rolling away. Right? A rolling away. So that makes me think about a couple different things. But one of the things it makes me think about is putting off the what? The old, old man. man. Putting off the old. And not just... Um, not just, just putting things up on a shelf, but really, literally killing that thing. Like getting rid of it, destroying it. You know, not letting anything... And we were talking about how these, these kings would allow... God would say, destroy all of it. And it wasn't the fact that God didn't love these people. It was the fact that He knew that if they didn't destroy these wicked people, that they would come back and they would, be thorn, they would be a thorn in their side and they would cause major problems in their lives. That's what happened too, over and over. Yeah. That's what happened. Even to the point of destruction. Right? So, Gilgal means they're rolling away. And then they, when they left Gilgal, mind you, Elisha's staying right there by his side. It says they went to a place called Bethel. And Bethel means, and this is in verse 2, Bethel means the house of God. Right? Bethel means the house of God. So there's a rolling away. They're stepping into this new identity. And then in verse 4, Jericho, the word Jericho, it means a place of fragrance. Right? And the Bible talks about us in 2 Corinthians 4. It talks about that we release this fragrance when we're, when we're living consecrated lives for the Lord. It says we release a fragrance. And it says it, it releases this lovely, not just to God, but other people. You know, like there's just something you ever heard people just say there's something about you that makes me want to get saved there's something on your life that's because we're choosing to lay our life down for the Lord and that's the Lord flowing out of our life that's the goodness of God flowing out of our life so a place of consecration and then they went to the word Jordan it means to descend or to come down I thought that was cool you know, to descend or to come down. So when we're abiding, like he's abiding, he's staying there, he's consecrated, he's staying next to this man of God that God has instructed him to serve, and then God, what? God will descend down upon that. And we'll see the anointing come down and flow upon that. And of course, you see, um, as he continued to stay by his side, he didn't just get what he had. What did he get? The double. He got the double. And we're going to look at tomorrow, we're going to look at how Jesus talked about basically the same thing when he, when he stepped on the scene, how God, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, had anointed him to do all these crazy awesome things. And then he turns around and he makes this awesome statement, amazing statement. And he says, those who believe in me will not just do what I did, but what? Greater. 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 The double. The double. And that's just simply from what? From honoring God, honoring God and honoring His Word. That's hard for me to understand in my natural mind. For some people, their tradition makes that hard to understand. But you just made this profound statement about tradition. He says, through your tradition, you have brought my Word to what? To no effect. You have nullified my Word. So if I'm looking at that statement where Jesus says I will do greater works through a traditional lens or mindset and I'm not honoring that. Look, this is God. This is Jesus saying this about us. He's saying we won't just do the works but greater works. What should we do? We should honor that. We should receive that. Yes, sir. I can't really understand it. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. But you said it. You said it and I believe it. And it's not just... Reminding me, reminding myself, reminding you guys. It's not so we can puff ourselves up and say, look at me, I'm a super Christian. No, it's so we can make God famous. We can release His goodness on this earth, reveal who He is, and then 
that goodness will what? In turn, will cause all men to come and run and be drawn unto Him. And we're going to see this crazy harvest. See what a lot of people do is they they get one thing out of out of a scripture, and and all a lot of they think that's that's what that means. That's all that that means. But the word is multifaceted, yes. and God likes to do a new thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And one of the things that remains the same about Him is He likes to do a new thing in people. And people get fastened on to one little aspect when this thing's like a diamond. It's multifaceted. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Amen, Dave. Good stuff. Let's set our, let's set our expectations high today. You know, let's, let's believe God to do anything. Let's believe God. Uh, let's believe Him to do what He said He's going to do. Amen. Amen. When we honor Him, He said He'll honor us. He says when.